Hi everybody, let's in this video consider different measures of national income, that is different measures of economic growth. First of all, let's consider why national income statistics are so useful for a government. Well, first of all, national income statistics, that is measures of economic growth, provide a report card for governments to, uh, to see how their economy is doing, to measure economic performance, whether right now or over time. So to evaluate economic performance, national, e national income statistics are very important. Uh, national income statistics also, as a measure of economic growth, allow governments to see whether they are meeting their objective of economic growth. It also allows government to evaluate policy, uh, whether policy in the past has been successful in increasing economic growth, and maybe policy that is needed going forward to increase economic growth. It allows governments, it allows economists, it allows businesses to forecast expected demand going forward and expected growth going forward, which is very, very important. Uh, national income statistics um, can act as a very important measure of living standards, so for governments to evaluate current living standards and whether living standards have been improving over time. And also national income statistics uh, allow for a comparison of the performance of an economy compared to other economies out there in the world. So national income statistics are very important. Measures of economic growth are very important because they do all of those different things. Right, so what different measures of national income can we have? What are the different measures of economic growth? Well, the one that's used the most out there in the world is using GDP, or real GDP, yeah? and that is GDP adjusted for inflation. We learnt in the last video that there are three ways of working out GDP the income method, the output method, and the expenditure method. It doesn't matter which one is used because they're all measures of the same circular flow of income, so they're all going to give us the same figure. Um, GDP, you need to know the definition, is the value of all final goods and services produced in an economy in a year. That is the definition of GDP. Okay? So, the benefit of using GDP is that it gives us a measure of growth but also it gives us a measure of living standards in the economy. Because it measures income, the idea is if GDP goes up, incomes in the economy go up, thus giving us a measure of living standards. All right, but now let's understand what are the key issues with using GDP as a measure, first of all, of growth. There are three problems of using GDP as a measure of growth and using GDP as a measure of living standards. Okay, first of all, we can argue that there is a risk of double counting, especially if the output method is being used. Now, overcoming that, remember the, uh, the definition. We are measuring the final value of all goods and services being produced. So that can overcome the double counting issue. But in a simple form, what is double counting? Well, double counting is when we, we include the value of, of output in the primary sector, and then we include it again when that primary commodity has been manufactured into something in the secondary sector. So by including it twice, by looking at the value of the output produced in the, se in the secondary sector, we might be double counting that output, and that can inflate the final figure of GDP. Okay? But looking at the final value of all goods and services can overcome that double counting issue of the output method. What about informal activity? So maybe it's black market activity, illegal activity, like businesses that are operating that are not registered, and any other kind of illegal activity. Uh, that is taking place in the economy. What about informal activity like DIY work? What, what if it's subsistence agriculture work in developing countries? And what if it's you know, things like gardening, you know, washing up and things like that? That is all activity and that does have a market value, uh, but it's not going to be included in our GDP figure because it's not been registered. So all of the informal activity or black market activity would not be included in GDP Therefore, GDP will be lower than what it should be. So therefore, it's a, it's a problem if we use it as a measure of growth. Another issue is the errors that are likely to take place. I mean, think about it, you know, the final value of all goods and services produced in an economy in a year. Well, you need a huge amount of information to get that value perfect, don't you? And that information, that data can come from a huge variety of different sources out there in the economy. And it needs to be collected in a short space of time as well. So the chance for error is very large, which is why we often see two, three, sometimes even four revisions to GDP quarterly figures in the economy. What about critiquing GDP as a measure of living standards? Well, GDP just looks at output, the quantity of output. The quality of output has been ignored completely, i.e. the negative externalities of production are not going to be included in our GDP figure. 
So things like, you know, the costs of air pollution, uh, the costs of resource depletion, resource degradation, a loss of biodiversity, deforestation, desertification, all of these negative externalities are not going to be included at all. And you can argue if they were included, then living standards would actually be lower than what GDP suggests. Income inequality, nothing has been mentioned in GDP about the distribution of income at all. The kind of output produced, if lots of output produced is capital, uh, capital goods being produced, well that's not going to benefit consumers, is it? Capital goods being produced benefits businesses, benefits firms. It takes a long time for that to be converted into consumer goods and for capital output to actually make consumer products. So if there is lots of capital uh, machinery being produced or capital output produced, that's not necessarily going to increase living standards straight away. And we can also argue that you know, there are many other quality of life aspects that will increase living standards that GDP does not take into account. So for example, you know, um, health related outcomes, so the level of health care, the level of education in society, the level of freedom, you know, gender equality, uh, level of democracy, all of these factors you know, clearly will increase living standards but are not taken into account in our very simple measure of the GDP. Another issue that some uh, people might say is that what about individual incomes? GDP doesn't tell us anything about the average level of individual incomes uh, in the economy. Uh, so for example, you know, if uh, GDP goes up by 3% in a year, but population is increasing by 5% a year, then individually people are going to be worse off. Well that's where this next measure comes in, GDP per capita. Again, real GDP per capita will be the, the main use here, adjusting for inflation. That gives us an average measure of individual incomes in the economy. And there is a very simple equation to use. And that is taking real GDP and dividing it by the population. And that will give us an average measure of individual incomes in the economy. But there are issues with using this measure of national income or this measure of economic growth as well. The same issues as above, so all of the issues that we mentioned here uh, are a problem with GDP per capita as well. But there are some other issues too, specific issues. Um, in the world now, remittances are becoming so much more significant. What are remittances? Well, remittances is when uh, domestic workers, right, so workers in one country, leave the country and work abroad to earn higher incomes. Um, but that income is then sent back to the home country. That is a remittance. And remittances are becoming more and more significant. GDP or GDP per capita will not take into account any factor income earned abroad. If that's domestic workers working abroad, if that's domestic business working abroad, a lot of that income will be sent back home to the domestic country, but none of that income will be accounted for in GDP or GDP per capita, even though that income is clearly increasing living standards. If we look at remittances, that income often goes to families in the home country, in the domestic country, increasing living standards for those, for those families, but it's not being included at all in our GDP or GDP per capita figure. And what about the influence of FDI? The risk of using GDP or GDP per capita is that FDI could distort the final figure. Uh, foreign direct investment is when foreign firms come and operate in your home country. Yeah, and they, uh, they operate business in the home country. Now that will, uh, that will count towards GDP because it is production in your home country. Remember what GDP is. The final value of all goods and services produced in a country, in an economy, in a given period of time, in a year. So if FDI, foreign business, comes and produces in a home country, that is going to increase that home country's GDP figure. But the problem is that a lot of the income generated by foreign business will be repatriated, will be sent back to their own country, and will not stay in the domestic economy itself. Yeah? So that will lead to an increase in GDP, but that doesn't necessarily make people richer, because a lot of that income will then be sent back to the country where the FDI came from. Yeah, so that's not necessarily going to increase living standards. So GDP can be distorted due to FDI. It could be in, you know, increased drastically and influenced heavily by FDI, whereas in remittances are not going to be included at all. So we've got major issues. That's where GNI can come in. GNI or GNI per capita can be used to overcome both this problem and this problem of using GDP. GNI is defined as the total income generated by a country's factors of production, regardless of where those factors of production are located. Okay? So by looking at that, we can see straight away that factor income, you know, as long as it's domestic factors of production, will be included in GNI. 
So for example, income generated by workers who are working abroad, right? As long as they are domestic workers, that income will be counted in GNI. Domestic business, if they are working abroad, that income will be accounted for in GNI. But FDI income will not be accounted for in GNI because that is not domestic factors of production. We can calculate GNI by using this equation. So GNI is equal to GDP plus net factor income. That is, if we look at net factor income, the income earned by domestic workers and firms, regardless of where they are located, minus the income earned by foreign workers and foreign firms who are operating at home, who are earning incomes at home. So take that away. Net factor income is what we get as a result. So by using GNI, remittances are more likely to be taken into account, giving us a true reflection of living standards, especially in developing countries where remittances are very large. And also GNI will not be influenced by FDI. Um, and therefore the repatriation of profit idea is not going to be a concern when we use GNI because any profits made by foreign firms will not be included at all. So that overcomes these two issues of using GDP or G, uh, GDP per capita or GDP on its own. And therefore GNI is seen as the better measure of living standards, the better measure of economic growth in developing countries where these two things play a very significant role. However, the problem with, um, with GNI, a lot of these issues still remain. Uh, in fact, all of these issues still remain. And some economists would argue that all of these issues have got one fundamental flaw, and that is the environmental costs of production are not included at all. And they significantly can harm living standards. And that's where this final measure that we're going to look at of economic growth comes in. The idea of green GDP. Green GDP is a measure of GDP that accounts for the environmental costs of production, that tries to overcome the issue of not accounting for the negative externalities of production. There is a very simple equation to measure green GDP, and that is GDP minus the environmental costs of production. So take away the cost of air pollution, the cost of the loss of biodiversity, the cost of resource degradation, the cost of desertification, the cost of deforestation, etc. Take all of these costs into account, these negative externalities. Take them away from the actual GDP figure that we have calculated. All well and good to give us a truer reflection of living standards, given that environmental costs reduce living standards. But there are big problems with using green GDP. First of all, putting a monetary value on environmental costs is very, very difficult indeed, and quite normative, quite subjective, the way to do it. It is not perfect. So that is a big issue. And also, the way in which green GDP can massively reduce your GDP figure makes it a very politically sensitive thing to do. China tried this a few years back to use green GDP to overcome heavy criticism China was getting about the huge environmental costs in China. So they tried using green GDP, but they found that when they did, GDP figures dramatically fell. And politically, it was a very sensitive thing uh, to show how much environmental costs were, were, were there in China. And, and how low the GDP figures were as a result, and therefore much lower living standards than just using raw GDP was showing. Too politically sensitive it was proven uh, to use. So we can't ignore, even though that sounds like a very silly argument, at the end of the day politics will override uh, what economists might say is the best thing to do. If something is too politically sensitive, often it won't be used at all. So that covers uh, national income statistics, why they're useful, and different measures of national income, i.e. measures of economic growth with the problems of using them as well. Um, to overcome the other quality of life aspects that GDP does not include, uh, the HDI is often used as well alongside GDP to get a more holistic idea of living standards and how the economy is performing, not just in terms of income, but in terms of education and healthcare performance as well. So thank you so much for watching this video, guys. A lot of content there for you to take away. I'll see you all in the next video.